Let me get this out of here. Sure. Uh, okay. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, my name's Mike Cluck, and I'll be doing the uh, a walkthrough of industrial modularization. Uh, I worked half my life with uh, Exxon Mobil and the other half with the KBR Brown and Root, so I've seen both sides of the fence. It was really interesting this morning listening. Um, I have to give kudos to John Fish because I thought he was going to spread, end up talking about a lot of the slides I'm going to be talking about, uh, in particular looking at every uh, job as a module job first and then a fallback as a uh, stick built and some of the very early planning. You'll see I use the word early awful, an awful lot in the presentation. So anyway, uh, I'm not going to try to go with all the acronyms for the AWP or LEAN, but I think since y'all are all experts, since you've seen the two presentations, you can label which pieces of modularization is LEAN and which pieces are AWP. But Unique to the modularization, maybe not so unique, but in modularization, we end up using both a lot of concepts from both uh, groups. So with that, I'll start. We always, as our company, always start with a safety moment. I always like to start with a, a module safety moment. And so uh, this one is about uh, just planning. And the big jobs as shown here, whether it's a big vessel or a big uh, 15, 1600 ton uh, module that we're pitting on the uh, west coast of Africa, they always get all the attention. But uh, it seems to be the little ones that provide a lot of our drama, whether it's a hydraulic failure in the upper left or a, a uh, dock tie down area in the upper right or just a center of gravity issue on a on a inclined road um, so how do we how do we fix all this and how do we eliminate this drama we need to treat every module job or logistics job really every job is special heavy haul and heavy lift we treat it with respect regardless of the size and we provide the same amount of early planning no matter what the size we need to be consistent regardless so with that, I'll launch into the discussion. I always, I overuse this term modularization and, and I've, I've been corrected many times as to what I'm talking about. But as you can see from the pictures, I lump it modularization into one big uh, basket from the pre-assemblies in the upper left to a 6,500 metric ton uh, integrated module in the upper right, trailerable ones, ones that are built and moved with SPMTs and ones that are moved with uh, lift on, lift off ships. Basically, modularization, as I use it in this presentation and in general, is fabrication, assembly, and testing of a portion of a plant away from final plant site. I, I covered the gamut. Um, about 10 years ago, RT283 uh, research was industrial modularization and we developed five solution topics. I'll be talking about the first three here at the project level. Business case, execution plan differences, and critical success factors. And keep in mind, I'm going to reference these in terms of the uh, application of the lean and AWP uh, aspects of it without probably naming the specific three-letter and acronyms. Then if you go beyond that, we developed a, a standardization strategy if you decide to build more than one of these plants. And then at an industry level, uh, we tried, we had some enablers, which we hope the industry will take over. Uh, one of them John Finch mentioned this morning is you look at each job as a module first, and then you fall back to the stick bill. But with that, timing for early decisions. Uh, this upper part of the graph here uh, is from the RT283. I added the bottom part, the red, yellow, and green arrows and the potential benefits. The optimum time for determining modularization decisions is in what I affectionately call FEL0, or opportunity framing, or assessment. And I'll get into that in more detail. Uh, when you go beyond that, you can still modularize, but there are plans that have been set in place. And by the time you get to EPC, yes, you can still modularize, but you're really having to look at what it is you can do because you've already plowed a lot of ground. One example of opportunity framing, when you're just thinking about a plant, you're thinking about the site. And one of the things you need to look at at the site level is, hey, does this thing have access? Can it, does it have open water access? Can we actually get a large module to site? That's the type of thing you'll be looking at at opportunity framing. You can landlock yourself real quick and, and, and run out of your best option 
by moving inland, uh, maybe even less than a mile. So again, very early planning is required. And why? Um, the module typically is on the critical path and the module fab yard becomes an intermediate stop for everything. So what do I mean by that? Basically, each one of these modules becomes a mini job. And so when we try to complete them, we complete them with instrumentation, electrical, we try to complete them as plug and play. So everything at the module yard, these modules need to build, be built complete, ready to plug in. What that means is typically, depending on the size of these things, we may start this effort anywhere from six to 18 months earlier than what we would have sent this particular material to site. Yes, you do go ahead and send modules later to site in the overall planning scheme, but in many cases, you still need to get a lot of stuff to the module yard. It's, it's sort of out of sequence work. And so very early on, we need to plan how that works. So some challenges to overcome with respect to modularization. We need to, the design of a module needs to mature fast enough so that we can design the entire structure, procure the steel, and then do detailed enough of the secondary and tertiary steel in terms of bolt holes, supports for equipment, in order to set up in time for the initial steel fabrication at the mod yard. The entire process becomes a critical path, and you have to make special analysis of rotating equipment because when you're on a module, you now have a dy dynamics and a module flexure. If the towers are too tall, they may not be able to be supported at the module because of the uh, wind loads and the transport acceleration. So early decisions have to be made whether we leave the towers out or put them in. And the flare system is a unique thing. From a process standpoint, process people like to design that last, but unfortunately they go on a pipe rack, which is the very first thing we need to ship and install. So at the very least, we need to make sure that the process people understand that they're under a crunch to try to get some of these systems out so that we can get them to the mod yard and then get them to the site in time. Finding a fabricator. Uh, it's always a challenge to find a fabricator that is not too big and not too small, so sort of like three little bears, and, but it's the best fit for the facilities and it's the best, best fit for the uh, skill of the workforce. Grillage and sea fastening, two terms that are, are, are simple, uh, they're just how you tie the module to what it's being shipped to, but we have to find a way to do it to where it can be installed easily and it can be removed quickly because uh, uh, some vessels run anywhere from sixty to eighty-five thousand dollars a day and demerge if you take too long to get your load off of the vessel. And then early engineering design requirements. I'll go into that in more detail, but again, depending on the fabrication yard and what they need, we have got to backpedal. Uh, through the schedule to make sure we can supply it at the time they want. And engineering is additionally involved in fab yards, shippers, heavy haul contractors, et cetera. And in some cases, we need to look at this very, very early because if we can't get the schedule to match, we may need some pre-FID or financial investment decision funding in order to get the engineering done early enough. What this is all pointing to is we need to have talks early and they need to be fairly extensive about the schedule and the cost and how these people are going to be involved. So uh, path construction is big. The collaboration is very extensive on uh, early module job. And then just alliances required. So, and then to top it all off, it's not intuitively obvious how you'd modulize the process. This is a particular part of a plant that uh, the boxes are the same, the six colors or the different sub processes within that particular process. And when we did the module layout, we ended up with the six modules shown in the lower right. So you can see the, the what you would normally expect as far as how you might split something up. You have to look at the sub processes again. So again, you're getting back to the process people early. You're getting back to uh, uh, the people that uh, look at the risk. And also, you're bringing in construction because the path of construction needs to be evaluated and the ultimate uh, consumer, which is the operations and maintenance people, they are brought in very early because now we're messing with a plant that they know how it works and we're changing the configuration of it. They need to, we need to know what they like, what they don't like. Do they like the idea of having to go up two meters to get to the first level on a big module or do they really not want to climb that? So there's a lot of discussion that happens very early. So key players, it's everybody. 
and this this I was listening to the lean section and you know there's a lot of collaboration a lot of group group think very early on uh, that needs to be done and it's because of this module this need to have all of this stuff get to the module yard and be built efficiently and to be built on time so it requires all stakeholders to participate it requires an early and cohesive plan uh, it requires early commitment by all and modularization typically as I'll get into in a little bit is an owner driven uh, for more than one reason but uh, the owner needs to go ahead and have a commitment to it and his team and then the uh, the contractor team needs to be uh, committed to the goals so it requires continuity and collaboration it's really tough when pre-feed is done by one company and feed is done by another and there's a there's uh, you lose a lot in the transition, transition, so that all needs to be worked too. So we'll get into the first case, the solution element that we came up with. This was the business case process for modules. It's a 12-step process uh, when we went through the solution guide, and basically as soon as you have a project in your mind, uh, it's, it's time to go through this process. And I'll show you on another slide why, but you can see there's very, you look at it from a very basic standpoint. Is it technically feasible? Uh, you look at roughly uh, a schedule for stick building module. Um, since modules, the size of the module determines how long it takes to build them, you know, there's a, you may want to go with smaller modules that you can build faster. You look at the site survey, like I mentioned earlier, and then you've got module yard survey, modularization drivers, the size and the scope. You develop an index, develop a cost estimate, and then you determine whether it's viable. Can you do all this in opportunity framing? No but you can take a look at it and you can identify the things you can do. And as, as John Fish mentioned, you know, it's, it's a lot easier, or one of the two Johns mentioned, it's a lot easier to start with the module design in mind and then fall back to the stick belt than it is to go ahead and start with the stick belt and decide rather an FEL two or three that, ah, oh, maybe we need to modularize. So again, that's, that's the driver behind that. This slide right here, is a business case analysis by project phase. And new in the phase is indicated in yellow and complete is indicated in green. So you can see in opportunity framing, there are three or four items that you can identify. Uh, the modularization drivers, uh, whether it's feasible and where it might go. By the time you get to assessment or FBL1, you identified, uh, touched on half of these and you've completed two or three. Pre-feed, you've touched on all of them. And by the time you get to feed, you have taken all 12 of those factors for the uh, best business case analysis and you've pretty much decided. So if you're coming into feed and you're saying, I want to think about modules now, you've got a lot of a lot of ground to go back and look and see if you still can do that or just what you can do. And uh, to top it all off, it's this very messy slide here about optimum man hours to move off site. It, it's, it's not just an idea of, well, we're going to modularize some or we're going to modularize everything. You have to look at what the drivers are in the lower left. Is it cost driven or is it schedule driven? That will depend on how you adjust your schedule or how you how you make and how you build the modules and what you do. In the upper right is what we came up with with economic productivity factor, which is basically the cost of a man hour of work at the construction site versus the module yard. In this case, what it showed was for every hour you took off of the construction site, you had seven and a half hours of work that you could do at the module yard. So it was a relatively easy fit. But along with that, you go through this index, this 12-step process, which is drawn a little differently here. And you have to say, well, there's different costs that are additive to this. And we have to determine what is the best uh, number of modules, size of modules, and you add that all together and you come up with an optimum uh, uh, man hours to move off site. So again, you're talking with a lot of people, you're getting a lot of people together, schedule, cost, engineering, construction, the ultimate owner, O&M, and you bring them in as early as you can. So the second element we found in the, in the uh, research was execution plans, differences. And a module job, a successful one, is executed differently. We identified and validated 107 execution plan differences from uh, assessment through EPC, 
that in a module job you did differently. You either started earlier, it had more emphasis, started later, or whatever. Why are these differences important? Because every part of the project, a module project is touched. Um, there isn't a group within a project, if it's a modular project, that doesn't have some impact because of the fact that you're now sending a lot of this material to an intermediate yard to build. And ultimately, uh, this stuff shifts your project implementation slightly. So, differences. Uh, you can read these. I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can see in pre-feed it goes from organization and staffing, uh, safety, labor relations, the contract strategy, uh, planning and cost estimating, the transportation route, and risk management. That's all in pre-feed. And then in design, you've got more module scoping. You're talking to the fabricators and subcontractors. You're looking at your heavy lift facilities, uh, your business case validation, and you're trying to get a scope freeze. One of the big killers in a modularization job is making changes once you send it to the fab yard. That's the absolute worst thing you can do. The fabricators love it because it's, it's change order city, but it's really not good for the rest of the uh, project. The third item that I want to touch on is critical success factors. And, and what are critical success factors? And these are key elements in a successful modular project. And I'll get into the list of them. Uh, and they complement both the business case and the execution plan differences. How are they determined? We identified in the research 72 of these, and then we ranked the top 21. Then we went to a of, of modularization, can't say that, authorities outside, and we confirmed. And then following that, there was also some postdoctorate work. There was a direct link to how many of these critical success factors were followed and how many of them were not. And they were directly linked to whether the module job was a failure or whether it was a success. And uh, so statistical analysis confirmed there was a direct link between these critical success factors and module job outcomes. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because, uh, well, let me get to these first, but these are, you look through these and they're really common sense. You look at the envelope you can ship, you align on your drivers, uh, you look at what the owner has as far as planning resources, there's a timely design freeze. You look at preliminary module definition, number nine, contractor leadership and contractor experience, very important. Investments, early investments in studies, O&M provisions, transport infrastructure, continuity between project phases. Uh, the more of these that you can hit, and this doesn't just work for module jobs, this is any job really, but why do I bring this up? We found that on the 21 success factors, if you look over on the uh, right-hand pie, more than 42% of them were implemented by the assessment or FEL1 phase, and 60% were by before basic design. And then you look over on the left-hand side, who was responsible for it? The owner was responsible for over half of the critical success factor uh, identification, implementation. Uh, so what we're saying here is, as an owner, not only do you have to have be on the ball as far as developing, uh, making decisions, but you have to make them very early in the project. And so this is why it's important that you have all these early meetings. It's also why it's important that you have somebody uh, that has module experience on both sides of the table, for the contractor and for the owner. So, so what does all this look like? Um, module execution plan, uh, essentially, it's really the same whether it's a small or large module program, and it's really the same regardless of module drivers. There are certain things you have to do early. Uh, I've tried to break it down here into the four items, uh, the major uh, goals of each one of these uh, phases of the project. Opportunity framing, we determine whether modularization is an option and what that might look like. In FEL1, you look at the percentage. Do you just do 20? Do you do 50? Or like some of the examples were shown even on the lean concept, they got the 70 or 80 percent of pre-assembly or modularization. In selection, you then look at uh, 
basically the best fit within a module. How do you ideally put all these pieces together so that you can move more man hours to the fab yard? This involves subsystems that you have to put together and you put these subsystems together so you can do continuity checks, pre-commissioning, you can wire things up, put the hydraulics in there, test it, and do everything but short of commissioning and actually get the fluid going through it. So you try to get these systems so they're complete within a module. And then basic design is the optimum module case. So the question is, okay, what if I start late? Can I still modularize? Yes, you can still modularize. And uh, we even had in the in the research uh, a little blurb on what you need to do. And basically it's go back and go through the previous one or two phases and determine if there were any uh, any decisions you made that limited the potential. Typically there will be, and you have to acknowledge what they are, and then you have to determine whether or not the, uh, the revised or limited module scope is worth the effort. In most cases it is worth the effort, but you've missed a golden chance by not doing your planning early enough. So one early study option, uh, this is, there's different ways to approach the module job, uh, but in general, here's some of the steps that uh, I found have worked well for, for me. One of the early things you do over on the upper right, these little cost and schedule, the font is indicating the typical importance for this particular study we did. And in general, cost and schedule usually uh, go one and two or two and one. And, and so you identify the cost drivers, project drivers, but you work with the client to determine their interrelationship. You know, is there sustainability? Is there a carbon capture? Is there some other things that are significant? Is there local content that has to be required? All of this is important because this determines how you're gonna design the module and effectively what's gonna be in it and how much you're gonna do. Then there's physical constraints. Everybody knows this. You have to figure out the maximum shipping envelope but more importantly, or just as importantly, very early on, as I've mentioned, you've got to get the operations and maintenance people in there. We are messing with what they have to work in on a day-to-day -day basis, and they need to have input into it. So you give it to them as early as possible, including, you know, obvious things, this big module, what it's going to look like. You then identify uh, optimal modularization and options, and then you have something that you take to a module workshop. And this is done as early as you can. And this is similar to, I think, a lot of what the lean activities are where they bring everybody together at the beginning. But it's attended by all major project groups, management, client management, EPC management, all the way to operations. And it includes the disciplines too, the, the level two and level threes. Uh, early on, like I did in this one, I identify what modularization is, but just as importantly, I also identify what it is not. Some people have preconceived notions that a module looks like only an offshore platform and it's stuck with a certain size. And others think that it's only big or it's only small or it can only be trucked in. Yeah, there's all kinds. So we try to identify and open up a range of availability or uh, just open everybody's uh, eyes to what can be done and the various options. We discuss the options we developed and we talk back and forth about what it is people like and don't like. And then we go in by group, uh, procurement, construction, operations and maintenance. And we talk about their roles in this particular project based on what we've come up with, where it may be different. And we listen to them and uh, try to understand what it is that they like and more importantly, what it is that they don't like. And we work with them on it. The goal at the end of the day is to get a module plan that everybody will buy into. Uh, it's sort of like that happy feeling when some of the lean people get together and they say, man, this is, this is great to work on. When you have a plan and everybody knows where it's going early on and they can work towards it, uh, everybody's more enthusiastic about uh, working and coming to work every day. So it's more important than you think. It dispels preconceived notions and it creates a project-wide module synergy. So with that in mind, we would then go to look at the logistics and confirm that uh, the estimates that we previously had done, that they can be uh, accepted. Uh, we go into the fab yard. You can always, uh, there's a lot of challenges in the fab yard. You can get a fab yard that's too big and you lose your job in it, or you, uh, conversely, you can get a fab yard that's too small and you can, you can just almost run them into the ground by having too much for them to work on. There's all kinds of shipping options, setting options, 
Uh, and the goal here is to get construction and more importantly, to get operations to tell uh, us what it is the first thing they're going to start with. In some of these industrial projects, it's a steam system. So we have to get the steam system going up first, which means we have to get everything related to the steam system and all the lines through the pipe racks in it. And so there's this path of construction that gets discussed very early on from input, from operations and maintenance, from the startup crews, and then through construction. So then we go ahead and, and uh, along with that, we do a cost analysis. We look at uh, labor trends, both at the yard and sites. We look at tariffs. We look at all kinds of issues of bringing things in, say, to the U.S. versus building it overseas. Uh, critical schedule analysis. We do a fairly hard backward schedule analysis because what typically happens is uh, engineering likes to engineer a certain way. The module construction uh, fab yard is a machine. I like to think of them as a, a Ford Motor Company or what was mentioned Toyota earlier. Um, they have the best way to do things and they would like to do it that way. So you get the two people talking and make sure that the best way that they want to do it is a way that we can support, that engineering can support and procurement and support. It may require that we need to buy some stuff earlier. It may need to be that we uh, spend a little money to get something designed a little earlier, but all that needs to be worked out. And a recent example, um, project on the, uh, this, is, this has to do with uh, owner involvement and there's a project on the US Gulf Coast I was involved in and the modularization is actually showing to be more expensive. But the decision was made by the company that they were going to modularize. It was a brownfield uh, expansion. They needed to reduce project man hours on site. They wanted to reduce the congestion and they wanted to reduce the project workforce density in this construction area. They had an operating plant. They liked their plant. It operated. It made money. They didn't want anybody to mess it up. They didn't like people blocking the inlets and exits to their product as it's trying to go out on trucks. So everything that a typical construction project does to a plant they wanted to avoid. So very early on, similar to the meetings that I was talking about, the module meetings, the upper management, the owner came in, brought in all of his people uh, and brought in the client, I mean the contractors, and, embrace, and uh, talked about why they were going to modularize and basically uh, talked about the need to, uh, you know, modularized to maximize benefits. And along with that, he said, in order to do that, I want y'all guys to start talking to each other. I want engineering, procurement, and subcontracting to be in alignment. If the fab yard needs it by a certain time in order for us to get the modules out here so we can install it and get this line on with the minimum amount of people on site, then I need to know about it. If we need to spend money earlier to get engineering done faster, let's talk about it now. And he, taught, he challenged his operations and maintenance team he said, you have ladders, you have, you have uh, towers with all kinds of uh, levels of support on it. You look at that. If you don't need to go up there but once every one or two years, do you really need that thing? Can you get a man lift? Can you do something else? So we got a lot of good operations and maintenance input that actually reduced the cost of some of the tall towers and some of the access we had. And we had some other input that we had put uh, put in, and it was a very, very productive set of, of discussions. So again, O&M input very early can be very beneficial. And then we ended up with a module savvy team, both on the client and the contractor side. So a little bit about AWP and a fabrication yard. And for the AWP people, um, basically a construction work area, which was mentioned earlier, uh, equals a module. A large module is one construction work area, uh, say a set of pipe racks, small or several mod, small mod, modules, may be another uh, construction work area. The construction work package is the same as a fabrication work package in the fab yard. You have to remember now they're building these modules, which are a CWA, so the fabrication work package will be aligned with respect to the uh, construction work package because that's the sequence they're gonna build. However, the installation work package in the prefab at the fab yard will not necessarily, and won't be the installation work package during assembly. Um, the fabrication yard has 
within it a manufacturing process for piping and it also has a manufacturing process for the structural steel that is an assembly line process uh, it is most times it's very efficient it's based on the size of the material it's based on the metallurgy and it's also based on some other issues but when they're installing it they're building this module from bottom to top if it's a three-level module you may end up with a particular piece of uh, piping that will have three different uh, dates for installation depending on the module uh, level so while they want to go ahead and fabricate it all in these major splits they won't install them in those splits and again this is important because anytime you're messing with the fabrication yard and how it does its uh, manufacturing of these uh, mass-produced piping spools and everything else you are messing with their productivity and you're costing yourself extra money so again it's early early discussions about how they build this how they're going to build these things that needs to be worked back through engineering so that we can and procurement so we can get alignment on so some of the challenges with having a separate fabricator that's not involved is there has to be a balance. If, if you just go ahead and have a plan of construction that is not attuned to the way a fabricator is building, then the fabricator will not have effective shop utilization. There'll be lost time. You'll be having to build small bore pipe two or three different times instead of just once. Also, if you're buying a lot of third party stuff, uh, the fabrication yard cannot see it and get their hands on it right away. And typically, they can get surprised by either an early delivery, but most likely a too late delivery that causes disruption in the whole uh, uh, path of construction at the fab yard and their, their module sequence. Apart from material shipments, um, if they're working off of a model that doesn't have all the information in it and they have to have look at a set of drawings to add the additional information. That's wasted time and it's, it's, it's potential errors that you can see. And so the best thing to do is have a, a, a model that is complete and regular 3D model updates that are shared with the yard and the fabrication shop. And then once you get the module completed, we like to ship it complete, but there's always carryover. And so once the module is, is there on site, there are actually site installation work packages for modules that are doing things like all the interconnections, but also the removal of temporary supports and then completing any incomplete or carryover work. So uh, path of construction, I'm gonna walk through this. Uh, this was a great slide that McDermott allowed me to use these last two or three slides. And I thank Lena for, for a couple of the module talk she gave in our MCBA meeting. But this particular one I want to show is just the module route of some of the larger modules. They've already had several routes shown and they've installed all the pipe racks. So I'm going to flip through this. They're coming down the purple large uh, heavy haul route. And if you'll notice, the heavy haul route is much, much wider than the final uh, plant site roads. This is an issue for all, all you civil engineers. You'll see it right away. The drainage has got to be changed, and then you've got to come back later and put your, your final grading in. So again, you have to think about all this when you're laying the module, the plot plan out, and make sure you have enough room to have these things in here. So as we move, you can see the, uh, the box is coming in, coming up to this side on the upper right, and then we're going down all the way down along the bottom to the lower left to install the three modules over there. And then we come up and we start installing the modules along that purple route. And then we go up again and install these modules along the same route. Then we extend this route to include a couple of modules up here. And we further extend the route to again, move and install some modules on the upper side down as we're showing here. And then finally, there's a future site. And so this pink path is one that has to be left for the one later on, or, or maybe even after the, uh, the job is completed to install that one. So that's a, a run through. Um, like I said, I wasn't gonna put any uh, three letter acronyms on uh, lean or AWP to this, but I hope I gave the impression that there is a lot of uh, collaboration that has to be done very early on. Any questions?
Okay. So Steve, do you want to throw up Slido? Great, thanks. Thank you. So I don't lose my, we had a thunderstorm here. I was afraid I was gonna lose electricity. So I'm scared to touch anything. And uh, this is Lloyd Rank and I'm just gonna be moderating for Michael. So he's the important one. That's why he's on screen and I'm not. Actually, he's less coordinated. I have a question, Michael, while we wait for uh, questions to start rolling in on Slido. Um, would you mind uh, summarizing real uh, real quickly uh, your kind of key takeaways from this uh, session that you want people to remember? Uh, key takeaways are um, you've got to plan it early. It's never too early to plan a module job. And the right approach, which is where John Fish and Ford, Vega, and Davis were going was you start out with the module assumption and you only go to the stick build if it doesn't work. And the reason for that is you have, with a module job, you're planning things so far, you're having to do planning so much earlier that if you ever have the fallback to a stick build, typically you are in better shape than you would be uh, just planning stick build or even worse, planning stick build and then deciding you want to modularize late in the, in at the L2 or three. So along the, with that, there's also the other takeout of, there's a lot of discussion because of the execution plan differences. A lot of people are used to building it one way, uh, the stick built way. And so everybody needs to be uh, aligned to this different approach. One particular example in engineering is typically in a stick built, the piping uh, group is the one that drives the schedule and drives a lot of the activities. On a module job, the structural team is the one that is the driver because they need input for all these different disciplines, piping and special and equipment, in order to get the structural steel designed early enough to get it to the fab yard so they can actually buy the steel and start the, uh, the fabrication and erection. Okay. okay. Well, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Um, first question we've got, uh, yeah, how does it. procurement need to be organized for modulized plants by module? Typically, um, procurement is, is still long-term lead items and, and short-term. And I think what we've done in the past is we've identified which pieces of equipment uh, were on the module and we took a quick look at them and determined whether or not they could hit the, the fabrication schedule. One of the things, one rule of thumb that uh, some of our schedulers had is when you first cut steel on a fab yard, you should have all your equipment there three months later. And the reason for that is in about three months, you have the fab yard starting to put decks together and they wanna put them together in the easiest and most efficient way. And so the best way to do that is to get all the equipment there. Now that's unreasonable in many cases. So again, you have to go back and work with the fabricator to say, okay, this is where this is, this is coming out. But Typically, um, after you do on module, off module, you go ahead and set up. We set work breakdown structures by module. Great. Um, so Fernando is asking, how do you best manage carryover work, planned and unplanned? Um, we we used uh, last planner. We we had issues in one job I had where we had seventy percent of the material, but unfortunately, it was all the all the stainless steel fittings and all the carbon steel pipe and you couldn't put anything together so <clears throat> we did a lot of we had schedulers that basically looked at at an installation work package uh schedule early on to try to get it going but um you try to just monitor and make sure that your work is going to schedule and, and the fabrication yard but at the end of the day there's always carryover work for one reason you make sure that you have uh, somebody working it early enough so that they get the information to the uh, to the project site. The world's worst thing you can do is is send a bunch of extra man hours to a project site, which was trying to get man hours off that site by modularizing it. It's just a double whammy. So I uh, just plan and 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 monitor the plan. Uh, next question we've got, and we're back to three-letter acronyms, so I'll try and get rid of them. Um, 
is uh, how do you elaborate a fabrication work package? Um, so far, we use it as an acronym for installation work package to break down the fabric scope on the CWP for a module. <clears throat> um, the, the, the fabrication work package is going to depend really and, and it's something that the, uh, the fabrication yard has, has determined what they will put together. And if they're building it uh, by level, they will try to put fabrication work packages that will allow them to install those by level. And the only complication is uh, when they're doing some of the manufacturing of the piping and the steel, they try to also do that to be efficient. And so they may end up making uh, many more spool pieces than what they finally end up using to uh, actually install. I'm not sure I answered it very well, but it, it varies. So um, I'm, I'm gonna jump to uh, the question on how do you manage the fabricator? Uh, do you send uh, staff to their shop? Uh, yeah. And what type of contracting um, strategy works best? Well, the, the, best, the, best, uh, the best job I had was where we actually sent a completed engineering IFC set of kit over to the fabricator and we didn't have anything left to do on it. That seldom works, but typically you do have a staff there um, and it can be a fairly extensive staff, but you're really, the staff is there to really not tell the fabricator what to do to, but look at what he's doing because the fabricator actually works best uh, when he's left alone. Uh, the issue is, uh, these late inputs to the fabrication uh, plan, these changes to the modules, these uh, late arrivals of equipment uh, that really mess up the, the fab shop. It, again, I go back to a Ford or model Toyota assembly line. You want the engine to be there at a certain time, and if it's not, you really can't put the doors and the hood on. So you got the same issue here. Um, the best work is to make sure that you feed the, the fabricating machine. Okay, and um, in, in your experience, how, how have you seen uh, fabricators simulate the process of uh, uh, final tie-ins? Oh, simulate the process. Actually, uh, there's a whole, you can get into on one of the, the large jobs that we did. In fact, most of them we're doing now. We have single weld hookup, and basically you have enough in your 3D model design to, to actually design the, the piping and everything else so that it can be hooked up with a single weld when you set the two modules adjacent modules in place and it's 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 very effective it's a tried and proven way great and jay's uh asking uh if you'd mind elaborating the importance of having the fabricators input prior to engineering oh absolutely uh and, and what we've done on, on some of the big jobs and you don't just have to have one fabricator. Uh, we have had a couple of fabricators that we were interested in using. We brought them in very early. We wanted to understand from them how they build because the way they build, if it's pancake or if they build in a, a, a box type of thing, that affects how the uh, steel is designed and where the break points are. And so we have to get that very early so that the structural guys can, can design the structure so that it uh, matches how they're going to put it together. Uh, so uh, another question is um, managing, managing tolerances can be critical. Uh, this must affect the entire process. How uh, can you speak to that? Um, depending on the tolerances from module to module, um, there is, you have to be smart when you do your, your, your connections between uh, modules and if some of them are critical you can leave yourself a couple of degrees of freedom in in the orientation but a pipe rack to pipe rack uh, again with the the advent of 3d modeling and cutting it to that size you look at temperature differences there's all kinds of uh, details you go into on this single weld hookup you take temperatures when you ship you look at the temperature when it arrived you adjust 
and you can actually get down to where we had on one project we had over 9,000 single weld hookups and I think there were only about 100 or 200 that we had to redo so it's very workable. Um, there's another question on what if analysis when would you do that uh, throughout the project uh, life cycle? Um, the what if, the what if. Um, we would do that actually I'll give you an example, opportunity framing, the very first one where the, the owner says, I want to build a plant and, and I want to build it somewhere in Louisiana, Texas area. Okay. Uh, do you want to, is it the type of thing that's going to have equipment in it that will require a huge module or are you going to have uh, several trains like an LNG where you maybe have five or six trains of only a quarter, uh, you know, a quarter each? And so that will determine the size of the module, that will determine how you might get it to the site. And so with that, you say, okay, here's where you better be looking for your sites. And then when you go to the next one, okay, same thing in assessment. Okay, we have a site. Does it make more sense to maximize the modularization or do you have enough uh, craft there that you can get by with just doing some obvious uh, modularization? So you play these what ifs, and you look at the cost, you look at the, uh, the uh, how, how difficult it is for the crew to get to the site, and, and, and you do a lot of what-if scenarios, and, and really all phases, with the information you know. In fact, the business design case is to basically take that, you put in what you know, and then in the next phase, you evaluate and update it. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, <laughs> Module yards tend to be really efficient, but is there room for improvement by applying AWP and lean principles to the uh, uh, to the module yards? And uh, can you give an example? Um, it, that's a good good final. Um, a lot of the yards have different approaches to how they do things. They depend on uh, exactly just how integrated they are, uh, what they're output is and so they have uh if they're doing any type of pipe fabrication and structural steel fabrication that is basically lean principles and you will yes you could go back and say uh and typically they look at that again they try to do um remote uh, computer cutting of uh large steel they do all of this and they try to do it efficiently uh to minimize the amount of uh movement that the people have to do they they differentiate between carbon steel and stainless steel uh there's a lot of principles that they use can is there room for improvement with it um the people that i've talked to said yes you know uh but is it do they call it lean or do they call it awp uh some of them have like other people do with modularization they have a an idea of what that means but in general all fabrication yards do end up using both pieces of that principle now they do it to the extent that eric and, and jamie and them talk about uh, some cases yes some cases no and will it be an improvement again it depends on the fabrication yard because uh, some of them uh, there is some investment in trying to make that next step so it's a mixed bag sorry for the vague answer but i think there is improvement that is there i think you need to really be careful that you don't get in the middle of trying to uh tell ford or toyota how to rebuild their car on the assembly line okay well thank you so much michael you, you gave us a lot of great information i'm going to hand it back to Kristen, and uh she'll uh move us to the next session Thank you. Yes, that certainly was a lot of great information packed into a very short period of time and really appreciate the sort of tying where both Lean and AWP can um, support the work going on. So now we're going to turn it over to Peter Court, who's going to tell us a little bit about production systems, design and implementation. <laughs> 